Hello, welcome everyone to our music licensing webinar um, in partnership with One Music Australia. I'm Cathy Adamek, I'm the Director of Ausdance ACT. And firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we gather, which is probably a little bit varied depending on where you're coming in from, but in the ACT, it's the Ngunnawal people and their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd like to introduce One Music's licensing manager, Linda Hale, who'll be presenting today. Um, so I'll hand over to Linda um, and then you'll have some opportunities to ask questions um, that you've got in relation to music licensing at the end. So during this, um, uh, we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, and if you have a question, if you have a look down the bottom, there's a Q&A function that's um, enabled on the bottom left of your screen. So you just click on that and you type any questions through as they come to you. Um, and um, yeah, and then we'll... Uh, have a look at those questions afterwards and uh, either Linda, myself or someone from One Music will sort of work through those questions and then we can open it up a little bit more too um, as well. Okay, thanks Linda. Thank you Cathy for that lovely introduction and it's a pleasure to be spending my time this morning um, with members of the Ausdance community. Thank you for making the time um, to hear the information today. And thank you for your ongoing respect of the musicians, the creators, um, the recording labels and the artists that we represent here at One Music. We know that music is really important to you, just as it's really important to us. Intrinsic, really, in the process of, um, of tuition of dance and of dance performance. I want to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eroi. Eora Nation, um, they are the elders of the land on which I join you today. That is in Ultimo in Sydney. It's a lovely sunny day. I've got nice sunshine on my face coming in through the windows, which hopefully won't get too hot. And I hope that you have lovely weather where you are today as well. We can take a relatively informal approach to today's session. Really, my focus is to take you from a place perhaps of uncertainty to a place of, of comfort and some certainty um, and to dispel any rumours or misinformation that may be in the marketplace, um, anything that's scary that you think is associated with One Music, because I promise you it's not, not scary at all and we're not scary people. In fact, we're fellow creatives, so we're part of the creative ecosystem in which you also operate. I like to think that we have like minds, so to speak. So the process for today is that I will give a rough outline of how One Music came to be, and then we'll spend some time specifically on what licensing looks like in the dance and performance instructors sector. And I'd also like to address some general questions with regards to use of streamed music, how the license fees that you pay us are distributed, um, music recognition technology, and assisting me in the background is my lovely assistant, Sarah Barton. So Sarah is the account manager for the industry sector. She's just popped her camera on. You can see she is a human being like you and me. Sarah is in charge at the moment of responding to those questions that you have throughout today's chat in the Q&A section. So pop them in there and either Sarah will answer them live and so everybody will be able to see both the question that's been asked and the answer that's been provided. Or Sarah might nominate me to speak to an answer in a live context. So this is not my first rodeo here. Sarah's got a brief um, outline and understanding of the topics that I'm likely to cover. And so she may say that this will be answered live. And failing that, if we get to the very end and we're still finding that there are questions that need to be answered, then we will read them aloud and I will answer them in a live capacity. So we're ready to go, I think. So One Music is a relatively new concept in this licensing landscape but its parents have, um, have quite a history in this country. So the two organisations behind One Music are APRA AMCOS and PPCA. 
APRA AMCOS was, um, was birthed, so to speak, in 1926 in Sydney. So we're coming up on 100 years um, for that organisation in this landscape. And PPCA was born in 1969. Why the giant gap between the two? Well, when APRA first existed, sound recordings were not a thing. A performance, when we use that word, we literally meant that the music was being played in a live context. So there were musicians um, or singers who were getting together to perform music from, from sheet music um, and to bring that alive. And then it's only as technology evolved, of course, that we found ourselves in a world where a musical performance could be captured for all time. And that's what I'm going to refer to as being a sound recording. So PPCA represent the copyright holders of sound recordings. So in this context, we're talking about the people that performed the song, maybe it's Madonna, and the people that paid Madonna to record that song. So that might be Warner, her record label. So they are the creatives that PPCA are representing. And then APRA AMCOS in that context represents the people who wrote the song that Madonna is recording. So they may be the composers, they may be lyricists, and they may also be publishers who act on behalf of composers. So they are the members that APRA AMCOS represents. And in this way, one music is so named because you can come to one place where previously you needed to go to two and receive permission from all of those creative stakeholders in one license. So that's the history of One Music. And that only came into being in July of 2019. So a couple of years down the track, we had a bit of a rocky start. Who knew that we, the whole world was going to shut down in 2020 and thereon? If we did, we may not have launched in July 2019, but such things happen. And we now hopefully, as I think you would agree, almost on the other side of COVID. And so we're trying to return to or establish indeed what business as usual might be. And what that means for dance schools is that in line with the Copyright Act of 1968, which is a federal piece of legislation, it states that where music is performed outside of the domestic circle, that permission is required from the creators of that music. So domestic circle is your house and your car and any parties that you may choose to have at your home. There's no licensing or permission required for that usage. But as soon as you take music outside of that setting and move it into, in this context, perhaps a dance performance or dance tuition classes, then permission is required. And so one music is positioned to be able to provide that permission on behalf of the creatives that we represent. We represent those creatives in what's called a blanket licensing method. What that means is you don't have to keep records of the particular pieces of music that you're using or how frequently you're using them. Think of it, if you will, as the difference between going to a restaurant and ordering from the menu or paying a set fee for a smorgasbord. We are the smorgasbord option. So if you pay your licensing fee to us, then the selection that you have for your meal, so to speak, is entirely at your discretion. Okay, It doesn't need to be reported to us or kept records of or anything onerous like that. Okay. So what we did is we took a look at how music was typically used in this industry and indeed in many other industries um, around the country. And we developed what we call license schemes, which are particular ways that we measure the music use and that we collect license fees on behalf of. And in the dance industry, we look first at music in your classes because we know that that's going to be happening. Dancing to silence is no fun. Everyone knows that. So what we look at is how many classes on average you might have in a given week. So we then split that into some usage tiers. The first tier is one to five classes a week on average. The second is six to 20. 
the third 21 to 40, and the fourth 41 plus. Sarah knows at this point, this is when I say there is no pluser than plus. So we stop counting at 41. If you happen to have 60 classes, you will pay the same as somebody who has 40 classes. That's the first of some of the concessions that we've made um, in terms of looking at typical industry use. And it's a way of putting a cap for us on how high this fee will be. So by us saying 41 plus and stopping calculations of classes at that point, it gives us a fee cap, okay? And that fee cap is $744.18 per year per location. So not per class, not per quarter, not per month, but per year, okay? For an average of 41 classes plus, a week. So if we do that reverse engineering, and I'm certainly not a maths expert, but I do have a calculator that I'll use later. I hope you agree that we are setting that at a realistic rate per class. So to give you an example of, of what I mean, if we look at the earlier tier, the very lowest tier, which is one to five classes a week. The annual fee per location there is $186.04. Now I want to think about how many weeks in the year you might be teaching. And I think out of 52, it might be 40. If we say 40 weeks of five classes, I'm going to do 40 times five, 200. And then I'm going to take 18604 and I'm going to divide it by 200 classes and it comes out at 93 cents. Okay, so that would be as a rate 93 cents a class if you're operating for 40 weeks in the year and you had five classes in a typical week. Okay. Then I can look at the rates and they, they range then between the 186.04 is the, is the fee floor, it's no lower than that, up to the 744.18. In the middle, if you're curious and you're thinking I fit into one of those other buckets, the 6 to 20 classes a week sits at a rate of $372.09. And if you're in the 21 to 40 classes a week bucket, then your annual fee is sitting at $558.13. Don't want to forget the cents, do we, Sarah? No. So the other thing that we need to think of is that that is what we call, and that's GST inclusive, by the way, I should say, um, and also that in this context, license fees are deemed to be fully tax deductible as a legitimate business expense. So if you're wondering how you might manage that charge, keep that in mind first. And secondarily, know that if your license fees total more than $500 for a year, we at One Music will automatically by default set your invoicing schedule to quarterly to ease your cash flow a little bit. If you'd prefer to pay it annually, you absolutely can. And please just let us know that that is your preference. But otherwise, we will split into quarterly invoicing for your convenience to make that a little bit more affordable and smooth those costs out across the year. So that is the rate for if you are using music that is represented by both APRA and PPCA. And that's the majority of commercially available music. I should state here though, that I know that there may be lots of syllabi in use. You may be using particular syllabus and they may have recommendations of music that you use to accompany the teaching of that syllabus. And from time to time, that music can be commissioned specifically for that purpose. 
which might mean that it's what we refer to as being out of repertoire. So in the event that composer A has been asked specifically by dance, by dance syllabus B to compose their music, then they reach their own arrangement. And that's not music that's represented by One Music Australia. So Sarah, when you speak with her in the most delightful manner possible, will need to query you a little bit as to what syllabus may be in use um, in your studio and therefore whether we need to adhere to the published rates, which are what we call full rights, or whether there's something um, applicable for you known as a partial rights deduction. So because One Music, if you remember, has dual parentage, it may be in the syllabus context that on balance, you are using more music that only needs APRA or PPCA representation rather than music that needs representation from both organisations. The clearest example I can think of in this context for you is if you're teaching a lot of ballet. So because ballet is quite an ancient, ancient craft, the music is naturally older by association. And so you may find that if you're being asked to reference Schubert works or Beethoven works or Mozart or somebody of that era, then copyright only exists for a period of 70 years from the death of the composer for all works that they create. So what that means is the works of Mozart, Schubert, Beethoven and their, and their friends have fallen into what's known as public domain. That means that if they're performed in a live context, so if you have a pianist for your ballet classes and they are playing those compositions from sheet music, then there is actually no requirement for licensing in that scenario. Because there's no sound recording being used, you're using a live musician and the musical works that are being used are in the public domain. They are no longer copyright protected. So we suggest that you probably allow, give us a call when you've got 15, 20 minutes free because these are the sorts of things that we like to discover from you. We want to make sure, as I'm sure you do, that you're doing the right thing by the creators of the music that you're using, but that also involves us running a small interrogation, not a scary one, but that's the reason that we're asking all those questions to make sure that you're not paying more than you need to, okay? Um, the other example may be if, you're, if your studio is focused on ballet, and you don't have a pianist, but you use sound recordings, then we would still have a context where you would require a license, but only half of the rights that we represent because the work would still be in public domain, but the sound recording would be protected by copyright. So if we're talking about um, the song Fur Release, for example, we would find that if the Sydney Symphony Orchestra was commissioned to record that by ABC Music Australia, then that sound recording is protected and owned by Universal and by Sydney Symphony Orchestra. So they are entitled as creatives behind that sound recording to remuneration for use of that work outside of the domestic circle. However, Fur Release remains in the public domain and therefore there's no copyright protection on the musical work. So it's this kind of area in which we are experts. We're not looking to you to be experts. You don't need to figure this out, but we just ask for your assistance and your patience while we ask you the questions that we know we need to ask in order to determine whether or not you will be paying the published rate or whether you are eligible for partial rights deduction, which means that you only need the rights from one organisation, not from both. And in that event, those published fees are deducted by 48.25%. Not exactly 50, 
because APRA AMCOS is the organisation that is running One Music and doing the administration on behalf of PPCA. So we're reserving that extra 1.75% for the work that we, are, that we are doing in administering that copyright. If you want a really quick way to work out what your deduction would be, if you're sitting here thinking, Linda, that's 100% me, I'm ballet all day, all the way, and I only use sound recordings of classical works, how do I work out how much I pay? You take that amount that I gave you in the first place, so, uh, and then multiply by, I've got to get it right this time, 51.75 percent. So if we were using our 1.5 classes example, or one to five classes, I've got my 18604 annually. What I'm going to do to work out what my partial rights would be is I'm going to multiply by 0.5175 and it tells me now that my annual fee would be $96.27 if that's my scenario. Okay. Now remember, um, I've said it before, but I will say it again. Sarah has a trusty calculator, as do I, as does anybody that you'll speak to at One Music. So we can do that heavy lifting and that maths for you. We just need to have a really good sense of what music you're using in your classes so that we can make that determination for you. If you are an instructor and you travel around, we would, we would say that you are one location. So we know that you, a physical person cannot be in two places at once. So if you teach in Brunswick on a Wednesday and in um, and somewhere else on a Tuesday and somewhere else on a Wednesday, my mind is escaping me. I can't think of suburb names, my goodness. Um, then we would consider you to be one location. Okay, so you would just look at that rate. If you're running a very successful studio, firstly, well done you. And secondly, we would need to look at how many classes you were operating at each location if they were running concurrently. Okay, so again, that's just more of the information that we need from you to understand what's specific about the way that you run your studio or the way that you teach your classes so that we can make sure that we are exact in our advice to you as to what licensing is required. I'm gonna take a sip of water at this juncture. Feel free to also do the same. All right. We've got some extras then that we know that happen in a dance environment typically. And broadly speaking, they are the following. Dance school events, audio recording and digital music use, video recording, and perhaps music on a website. I'm going to address music on a website first, if you don't mind, just to include what it is and what it is not. So the website use that's covered here is intended if like when the internet was birthed, like I remember about 20 or so years ago, when you went to a website for something, music started playing when you visited that domain. And often you had to have a bit of a scramble to find out where you could, <laughs> where you could turn it off or where you could turn it down. If that, if that is the arrangement that you currently have for your website and you like to have background music when people are viewing the details of your studio, um, then this is the license for you. If you are wanting to put any kind of video of your performances or your students um, or routines on your website, this is not the license for you. Okay, that's a whole different, a whole different kettle of fish, as they say. That's a whole different aspect of copyright. So everything I've been talking to you about prior to this point is in relation to public performance. Remember we said that anything outside of your domestic life where music is brought into that context, it's known as public performance. When you put together two pieces of art that wouldn't normally go together, that were originally separate, 
So I'm talking now about perhaps using a sound recording in a video where you might be putting together a video of someone performing to a particular song. That's that kind of situation where we're taking two pieces of art and putting them together to make a brand new one. Okay, and that's known as synchronization, putting those two things together. Synchronization is a very special copyright in that an organization like One Music and similar organizations around the world are not authorized to provide those permissions. If you think about it for a moment, if I wrote if I wrote a song about blue skies and perhaps there was somebody selling whiteboard cleaner, I'm using what I can find in my environment, and they wanted to run an advertisement for their whiteboard cleaner and they wanted to use your song, Blue Skies. What the Copyright Act says is that you, as the writer of Blue Skies, have the ability to authorise or to deny that request. Because what's happening in the minds of the people that are seeing that ad is whenever they then see that whiteboard cleaner, they're hearing your song. So remember that this whiteboard cleaner could be a political campaign. It could be adult diapers. It could be an issue that you do not agree with or a product that you do not want to support. And so if that piece of, if your piece of art is used in association with that, that would be damaging to your original piece of art. And so that's why the permission is only given in what they call a direct manner. So where One Music can assist in this sort of situation is we can provide you with contact details for who the owner is of the sound recording so that you can ask for permission, but you need to be aware that they may deny permission or they may say yes, but they may set a fee schedule that's not within, that's not within your financial budget. Okay, um, so same applies for advertising as it does for your for your videos of of choreography. Okay, if you choose to place those videos on a site such as YouTube or Facebook or Instagram without obtaining those permissions, I can't stop you. Obviously, um, be aware that there is a license in place in the background. Uh, for Facebook and Instagram and what am I saying? Facebook and YouTube, my goodness, um, where they have a license with One Music, sorry, with APRA, but only for the musical work. So you may upload your video of the choreography um, of Sia Chandelier and from a musical work perspective, from the composition perspective, you're covered, but the owners of that particular sound recording may say you didn't seek permission to put my piece of art into your piece of art and they can issue what's known as a takedown notice. So any video that you place on those public facing platforms can be subject to a takedown notice and it's important that you're aware that the, re the way that those are monitored is actually not by humans. So it's not people who are dialing up various addresses in YouTube or having a look at Facebook URLs. It's actually, um, it's actually little robots that have been deployed to recognize the sound recording of their owner. And then they issue an automatic notice to the owner of that platform to have the video be removed. So if ever you've gone to view a video on one of those social media platforms and you, and you can see that the, this has been removed, that's probably the reason why, is that the people that own the copyright behind the works that may be used in that video have not provided their consent for that to be created. So a little aside there, but I know that what happens a lot um, in, in this group is that you want to show the routines you want to show um, videos of the work that your students have, um, have learned. So that's the website use section. If we then think about dance school events, it's typical that you would like to have your students perform 
um, on a regular or semi-regular basis in order to demonstrate the skills that they've learned. So because of that, we have changed the way that these are licensed. Historically, so pre-2019, the process was a little arduous, I have to say. Um, and the responsibility was on you as a studio owner each time you were going to have such a performance to approach the APRA AMCOS team and the PPCA team in order to secure event licensing. And that required you to provide a list of all of the works that you wanted to use, their duration, um, and, and then also pay your invoice based directly on those works. What we've done now is we've said that any dance school event where the entry is $40 or less, and that's including GST and booking and handling fees, can be covered under this license in advance. So you would just say to us, I'm planning on having one event this year or I'm planning on having three events this year. And we can license those again in a blanket manner. So you're not going to have to, first you don't have to get, a, going to have to remember to contact us ahead of that event. It will already be baked into your license. And secondly, you're not going to have to nominate the works that you're using. So we hope that you agree that that's going to be a time-saving measure on your behalf. And what we look at there is we price per event, except when we don't. <laughs> so if it's one event, it's $212.62 for the licensing for that event. If you have more than one, we put you onto what we call unlimited number. And again, this is a way that we've capped the fee so that it's not going to keep iterating into the thousands of dollars because that's not what we want and that's not fair and reasonable. We've then said that an unlimited number of dance school events is $425.25. So for the keen um, math brains among you, you would realise that that's twice the cost of the single event. So any number greater than two, that will be your cost for the year, 425.25. Now, again, it stands to reason that if you were using music that attracted a partialised deduction in your classes, then that would also extend through to your events and you could also apply the 48.25% discount in that context there. Then I want to look finally at some packages that are to do with recording. The first is to do with audio recording or music being delivered by digital means. So as a recap, you'd remember that the tariff at the beginning for the classes was for public performance. When music is delivered to you via digital means, so where it's not a CD that you can hold in your hand and put in a player, if you're using something like a, we call them digital music services, you might know them as things like Spotify or Tidal or Apple Music. If you're using those platforms in your studio, then there are additional copyrights, which the creatives are entitled to. So similar to how I introduce you to the term synchronization, this is where I need to let you know about the additional copyrights of reproduction and communication. Reproduction is what it sounds like on the tin when a copy is made of something. So in the instance that you're using a streaming service, a copy is being made for you for that time that you have called it up on demand. You're not borrowing the original sound recording and giving it back. Otherwise, nobody would be able to listen to the same song at the same time. So there are millions upon millions of copies being made on a daily basis of each work as it comes into your playlist, okay? Or as you ask for it to be played, a copy is being made. And then also because that copy is being delivered to you via wire or wirelessly, then a right known as communication kicks in as well. So the first, we're just looking at classes and public performance. If you are making recordings for your students so that they can practice at home, or if you are using a digital music service as the music source for your classes, then we need to look at the audio recording and digital package for you and put that in place. And that's, that is calculated by the average number of students that are in your dance studio. 
So there's a minimum annual fee of $32.16. So if you're only just starting out or you're a very small studio, your fee may be $32.16. Otherwise, we take the per student rate of $2.15 and then figure out your final license cost by multiplying that by the number of students you have. Likewise, if you're going to take, if you want to take video of your performances, then we have some special, um, we have some special dis dispensation in this context that a limited number of copies can be made and made available to your students, provided that they're not broadcast, okay, provided they're not shared publicly. If they're for private home use only, then you can take out this package on your license, which is again calculated by the average number of students, again has a minimum fee, so it won't cost less than $64.32. Otherwise, we would take the number of students and multiply that by $4.28. And that's allowing for three copies per student per event. So if you're having three events across the year, and the same student is in each event, then effectively for that $4.28, you're entitled to make nine copies, okay? So we like to think that's quite generous. We settled on three so that the parents can have them and then there might be uh, either the two sets of grandparents or there might be a, a grandparent and a neighbour or, or something like that. So we're trying to think of the ways that are being used and give you the most value for that, for that money. Um, that's the crux of the, of the license agreement. What I've not touched on at all for um, the good folks at Ausdance today is what we do with the money that we collect. So it's all very well and good for me to talk about the fact that you have a smorgasbord and you can select anything, but I'm sure you're then thinking, how do you know <laughs> who to give the money to, right? So the first thing I want to let you know is that there is a worldwide standard for collecting societies such as One Music um, around the world. And that standard sits somewhere at administrative costs of 12 to 15% of the monies that are created, that are collected rather. So I can tell you that our rate was 14% in last financial year. So that rate is paying my salary and the salaries of other people in this building who are trying to work out who gets what from the money that we collect, but it's capped, right? So we then have 86 cents from every dollar that we get from you. That's going to, that's going to the creatives behind the music that you used. Now, what we do, because we know that we're not asking you to report, what we do is we look at data from radio stations, from TV, and from streaming platforms who report to us already. OK, and we have said in the past that we think that that's indicative, that's close to what would be used in a studio on an ongoing basis. Now, we know it's not ideal. OK, I'll say that up front. And so what we're looking to do is employ what's called music recognition technology or MRT. And this is where potentially we need your help. So there is a an amazing little device recently created called Audu. A-U-D-O-O -O is the name of the company. And they have a product called an audio meter. It's smaller than a phone. It's bigger than a battery, but it's about that kind of size. And it plugs into a PowerPoint in a venue. And it's like a professional Shazam. <clears throat> if you've used that on your phone, so what it does is it's listening to the music that's being used and it's reporting that through to the cloud with special technology that means that it's compliant with all privacy laws, particularly in, in the UK where they're quite strong um, and it doesn't listen to conversations, okay? So it's got the technology to only hear what it needs to hear and it takes a small capture of that music and then sends that report through. So essentially what that technology is doing is doing the heavy lifting that we know is not practical for you to do. It's actually making, it's gonna form a report of what you used in your studio. 
And I know as well as you do that if you're teaching jazz dance or tap dance, you're probably using you're probably using music from Chicago the musical. And is that being played in in on radio and on Spotify and on TV? No, it's not. Right. So this is a major step for us in terms of improving our processes and getting better data in the door so that we can better reflect the music that we know is being used in your sector. So at the moment, those devices are being offered free of charge when you obtain a One Music license, if you'd like to participate in our trial. So please make sure if you're in touch with Sarah or any of the One Music team, that you let them know if you're interested in participating in this trial for or do, so that you can help us better distribute the monies that we collect from your sector. Okay, it's really exciting technology. Um, One Music is the first collecting society in the world to partner with Ordu. They're a British company. They have some rather large uh, names behind them as angel investors, two of whom you may recognize, Paul McCartney from the Beatles <laughs> and Bjorn and Bjorn Olvaeus from ABBA. So they've got the goods. They are here to stay and they're going to revolutionise the way that we administer music copyright and royalties and they will do that around the world, which is really exciting. Um, you might be wondering how many songs are they going to recognise? Maybe they might recognise the music that I'm using because I use some pretty obscure stuff. I can tell you that so far in their library, they've made 70 million matches. So chances are really good that whatever you're using in your studio is going to be recognised, which can help us shape a pay and play method, right? Where you play it and then we can pay it. It's going to help us get much closer to that. And the reason why we need to sit at, a, I guess, at the way we are, the way, the way that the, the system has existed before, um, why we don't currently sit on a pay and play model um, it's just because the administration burden would be massive. So remember, we're capping our costs at 14%. It would literally invert that equation if we were to swap that around. It would take us 86 cents in every dollar if we were to work through reports from every client who had a license with us. And then we'd only have 14 cents to give out from every dollar. So our members have agreed that joining that joining respectively APRA or PPCA is their best chance of making a living as a creative and a better chance than them knocking on doors, having to say, I make recordings or I make music, would you like to use my music? And can we arrange a fee for same? So I think I'm just gonna do a quick look on my checklist. We've done, a mon we've done a One Music history. We've done how we measure some licensing. We've talked quickly about syllabus. We've talked about distribution of royalties. We've talked about audio meters, streamed music, Facebook, social media and synchronizations. So if you're still with me, and I hope you are, um, then we're going to dig into the Q&A now to see what's there and how I can further help you. On that note, Sarah Barton, are you there? I am indeed. And thank you, <laughs> Linda. You've done a wonderful job as always. And we've had a question pop through and it's a terrific question, actually. Okay. Um, question in regards to dance studios who already hold a one music license. Yes. Once, great. The, new year, once the new year clock's over, they'd like to yes. know for their membership, do one music reach out to the studio to touch base on their new year ahead to understand financial changes, for example, student numbers, class numbers, studio locations, et cetera, or are the studio owners required to contact one music? Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. And thank you, whoever asked that for, yeah. Um, prompting me to tell you something that I should have told you. Hooray. Um, so how that all works is that your license is set for, it's a renewing license and is set for a 12 month period generally. Um, we are planning to make contact with 
um, with the dance sector um, in the coming months to talk about licensing and whether any changes are needed. But what I would suggest that you do um, as best practice is if your license is due to renew in September, for example, I would think that in the month of August, if you haven't heard from One Music in the first two weeks of August, and you know that you have some changes to be made, I would suggest that you contact us. So go backwards a month from your due date, give us a fortnight to see if we're going to reach out because if we will, it will start with a form letter and it'll come out in the first fortnight. And if for whatever reason we don't happen to do that, especially if you know you've got changes, please reach out so that we, we can make those adjustments for you. Failing that, if you forget to do that, worst case scenario, you get your new invoice. We can still, if you act promptly after receipt of that invoice, we can still make an adjustment for that license year. Okay, good. Sarah, what else have we got? Perfect. And another um, question has come through this one is about the dance school events. So it's a great okay. question. Um, so what happens if a ticket fee yes. is over $40 is question one. Good, yes. Um, question two is will this ticket fee amount be adjusted anytime soon to match inflation and the increasing costs involved in hiring venues and holding performances? i.e. it's getting extremely difficult to cover costs and break even with a $40 ticket for many studios due to all the increased overheads. I understand. Okay, thank you. Um, that's another great question. So the process for if you're over that $40 threshold is to go the old school way, is to go to our events team and they will provide you with a license. That does mean that you will need to have prepared the list of works that you need to use or that you want to use. Um, and there should be no problem in approving those as long as you're not, as long as you're running a concert in the traditional sense of a concert. You only need to get individualized approvals like that direct permission that I was talking about for synchronization, that can kick in if your event is actually a piece of drama, what we call dramatic context. So it's the difference between, what did we say last time, Sarah? I think a, a story that has chapters or a book of short stories. If your performance is akin to a book of short stories where they may all be themed, um, and they're all about summer or they're all about frogs or whatever it may be, then that's perfectly fine. And you would just send through that concept application as you normally would, and there'd be no problems with approvals. If you are telling a story, so if you're actually writing a book that has chapters and there's a journey of characters from the beginning through to the end, then this is a situation known as dramatic context, which is another type of copyright and it's a direct one. So that's where the people who wrote that piece of music get to say yes or no as to whether their piece of art can be included in your piece of art. And then they also get to set their fee. So short answer, over $40, we would ask you to refer to the events team to put in your individual license application. In terms of that, in terms of that fee being set at $40, I agree with you personally. As, as me, not as, not as Linda, the National Licensing Manager, I agree with you personally that I think it's time for a review. Um, we have reviewed it in the past. So in COVID times, we temporarily increased it to $60. Um, and there may well be justification for it to move again. Whether 60 is appropriate, I'm not sure. Maybe it sits at 50 in the intermediary and perhaps if you're already licensed, um, perhaps I can pass on my contact details to Kathy um, so that you can get in touch with me and talk to me about what prices you think might be, might be a better fit. If we could do that, Kathy, and she's going to nod, I think, yes, that would be, then that would be of benefit. It would be great for me to hear from you specifically as to um, the situation that you're facing. Yep. What else have we got, Sarah? 
that's it for today. And of course, um, everybody keep popping them through and we'll of course, continue yes. to answer them if, if there's anything else that comes to mind. But um, and otherwise, Kathy I might have things Kathy too. Does. Yeah, yes. I did. I thought I had a question that relates more, I suppose, to independent practice and professional independent practice that um, tends to, you know, for example, if you're an artist who's been engaged by a festival or a venue, yes. uh, I guess it's also kind of uh, is a question more generally about where venue responsibility sits around music licensing as well too, particularly sure. when they sort of contract Contracting or dealing with sort of small, small, you know, artists who are doing sort of one-off gigs, you know, here yep. and there. It used to be the case, my understanding was, that if you were kind of booked or engaged by a bigger umbrella festival, that often that they were the ones who had a licensing agreement that you were covered by. Is that still the case? It can be. I think it's it's best practice to check individually the documentation that you're signing when you're agreeing to perform at a particular venue or as part of a festival. In, in, in terms of general advice I would give to you, the onus typically rests for licensing with the person or persons that are authorising the performance. So if there is a festival or a venue that has approached you and has said, Kathy, please come and dance here with us, then that's a clear that's a clear case where they are responsible for obtaining the license. If you, Kathy, have a performance that you want to put together and you want to hire a venue, then it's more likely that that onus is going to come to you because you are the person that's agitating, right? You're acting as your own promoter in that case. So if you are being engaged in something, if you've been asked to attend or invited to attend, it's typically going to sit with the venue. If you've approached the venue, then it's typically going to sit with you. I know they're really broad strokes, but that's generally how it, how it falls. Yeah, that's a good rule of thumb. Thank you. Yep. But, but yes, ask if in doubt. That's yes, awesome. absolutely. And check your and check your um, check your contract. It will generally be placed in there. There are some festivals. I think Fringe is one in Adelaide, um, where they actually say in their contract, "You are responsible for yes. any music licensing." The so just check. Would, yes, because yeah. they don't curate. But I guess we, if you're actually right. a curating festival and you've invited artists, yes, the owners would normally sit on that festival too. Yes, so you're right because Fringe is saying, "Would you like to participate?" So you're putting your hand up. So yes. Yes, it fits within that general rule, which is if you're putting your hand up or you're the agitator, then yes. it's likely to sit with you. Yep. Yep. Great. Thank you. That's all right. There's a question. I can, I could see your name before, but I can't see it now. Somebody who has their hand up. Hello. Yeah, Deborah. It's Hi, Deborah. Deborah. Hello. Um, well, thank you uh, very much for all this very exhaustive uh, explanation. <laughs> I need to rewatch the video. Of so course, really, that's fine. There's a lot of good information. But uh, linking myself uh, as um, this, just what we just discussed now, being an independent artist, which is one yes. of the things I do. Um, maybe you said it and I lost. Uh, that's that okay. Much. But uh, um, so if I want to create a one-off performance or two yes. nights only, yes. and uh, it's all on me, um, mm. does the licensing have to be specific for those two days? So we create a package for those two days, or because I'm also a dance teacher, and in my activity, you said before, I am covered in a spectrum of one show a year. Would that be a package that would suit an independent that teaches in different places in the same territory, like Canberra, for example? Plus yes. This person is allowed to have a one or two night shows under the banner. It would, my question to you would be, when you operate as an individual, are you operating under the same ABN as when you teach? Yes. You are? Yes. Okay. I think that in that, in a context such as that, I would say that there would be scope for you to have some, maybe some coverage under your dance school licence, but I will note that this event actually does say dance school event. Right. So I think that in, in, in looking at that carefully, I think that yeah. we would say that the dance school event should involve students. Yeah. And if it doesn't involve students, then we should think about that separately. Yeah, perfect. That makes total sense. And okay. actually in the past, it did involve the students. Yes. 
So that yes. probably would have been the um, that I would suggest that they may have been included then. Yes. So there'll be some crossover probably depending on on what you're choosing to create. Yeah. Very good. I have another question uh, yes. more as an independent teacher yes. that works uh, in a collective of teachers. Okay. And um, we operate in different positions in different areas of the territory. Yes. Under the same uh, type of class, but uh, it is not just one person teaching. We are different people in different in different areas. Mm. So there's a an umbrella of classes. Yes. And we are all independents coming in. How best to organize the music licensing when you have a collective but not an organization yeah that's something possible or yes one i'm actually going to jump in with that one because i know the structure because we auspice this organization and they <laughs> so they're also auspiced by Oz dance um, but in yeah. fact they're funded by various venues so to okay. me because the venues are providing it to me again that's I would say that the buck stops. And I personally think I would certainly advocate for that position with the venues to kind of protect or, you know, because they kind of been invited really to do the classes because by the venue. So the venue to me is responsible for holding that licence, not those individual teachers. That would be the, the position I would sort of suggest anyway would be, um, you know. Yeah, it's, look, I'd, I'd probably want to, I'd want to be, I'd want to be clear on the arrangement and probably perhaps we can take it offline, Deborah, if you'd like, so that I can answer specifically. Um, yeah. But there is capacity under the dance under the dance scheme, certainly. It doesn't only apply to schools, it can also apply to performance instructors. So it may be that each of the instructors hold a license for that and any other classes that they teach because I'm assuming that wouldn't be the only they're probably not the only um, cohort in which you're involved right so it may be that each of you are covered individually anyway but certainly happy to discuss the individual circumstances so I can be specific right. and definitive but that also explains too now what you're saying is that really individual teachers who are freelance even though they're yes. working across a, a number of different let's refer to them as portfolios as, yes as independent practitioners yes. a bit like with insurance now also need to carry their own music licensing kind of tailored packages as well which would kind of fit into um different models if you're moving into a, another yes venue. personally i would still advocate for a position where if someone got i mean what if someone gets caught i mean i know there's not a big monitor out there with you guys <laughs> no going, oh, no oh. certainly not um no. <laughs> but I would have thought there's some some responsibility in the sector or the ecosystem i still feel for the venues to be kind of covering because i totally understand that our artists our musicians need to be covered for this in the in and the music yes. industry needs to be but i do think a lot of the buck stops with the bigger venues like the bigger fish are the ones in some ways that need to protect the smaller fish in this and is that sort of how you guys approach, approach yeah it can this? be we will we do find that um that a lot of our licenses for venues exclude dance because we know oh. that because we know that the instructors can be individually licensed and the license can travel so um except this is where i would sort of say they're not necessarily instructors they're often artists as well and i and i often feel quite sort of you know, there have been times I've really wanted to, to actually approach a specific musician and go, do you realise yes. what you're doing? <laughs> you, yeah. know, you know, why do you have rights that we don't, you know, in this particular sort of ecosystem? Because, you know, yeah. our choreography isn't protected this way yet. So so I sort of feel that there's a, there's a bigger dialogue that needs to be understood, particularly by one music, about um, the, the fact that you're also got dealing with artists. You're not necessarily dealing with commercial studios who are just, you know, who are, who are you know, have got a business model. You're also dealing with artists when it comes to dance as well too. Mm, yeah, sure. Um, it, it, there, and there may be some... Um, there may be some crossover there if you're acting as an artist that you, perhaps you're going to be your own promoter, which might mean that it that it's all sitting in events licensing. So certainly mm -hmm. we can dig into this. I don't want to avoid the question by any means, mm -hmm. but I think we, we're probably not going to reach an agreement in the next one minute as, no, to, but it's just <laughs> as to how to handle this best. Yeah. <laughs> No, I just yeah. tend, I tend to think, as someone who's worked in this space for many years, um, is that it's it it is it does fall on the, the bigger booking venues who are sort of who who in fact who invited this into their you know into their space so um rather than the individuals yeah 
yeah, great. And that's, and that's one way of dealing it. So, so the musicians also get looked after as well. Yes, yes, of course. Thanks, Deborah, for your questions. Are there any, is there anything else, Sarah, that's popped up in Q&A just before we close? Yes, Linda, there's a great one um, okay. regarding um, what authority do mm. you have to enforce having a music licence to those studio studios who currently don't have one? And okay. is there somewhere to report unlicensed studios? Okay. So a couple of things. So an unlicensed studio may, well, an unlicensed studio may look just like a licensed studio and a licensed studio may look just like an unlicensed one is the first thing to say. So we will, we will provide stickers that can go on people's doors and their cars or wherever they'd like to put them um, when they obtain a license, but it's not a license requirement to display that sticker is the first thing I'll say. But if you have concerns that someone is operating um, near or adjacent to your territory and they may not be adequately covered, you can report that to hello at onemusic.com.au. We won't let you know for reasons of privacy whether or not your suspicions are correct, but we will take that information internally and approach them if we need to. Okay, in the same way that we wouldn't tell anybody whether you as an individual or your business was licensed because it's nobody's business but yours. In terms of what we have to, in terms of how we might, um, how we might enforce the licensing requirement, because we act as a member collective, we like to be as understanding um, and as generous as possible in terms of time, um, and allowing somebody to come to the realisation that they require a licence on their own. So typically we're talking about, we may proceed to, um, to a court hearing, but this is only going to happen in circumstances where all other avenues have been exhausted. And potentially then there may be damages that need to be paid in terms of back licensing and also in terms of penalties by the individual's um, or the directors of those companies. We have some pending legal cases at the moment, actually, um, not for this industry, but for a restaurant and a hotel um, and a childcare centre and that kind of thing. It is our last resort, but in terms of you trying to assess what is the worst case scenario if I don't do this, that's what you're looking at. That's where you'll end up, where there'll be legal costs that you will incur as well as the licensing costs that should have been paid in the first place. Yeah. Well, that's not a that's not a happy note to end on, but I do, <laughs> but I do really appreciate your time and attention today. Thank you to my able assistant Sarah. Thank you to Deborah for putting your camera on and asking some questions. And thank you, of course, to all Oz Dance members and particularly to Kathy for your invitation to speak to your group today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Thanks very much, Linda. It's, um, yeah, as I said, we really, uh, oh. <laughs> oh, now I'm back again. You're back. <laughs> Put my glasses on because I can't see it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, um, thank you very much, Linda, as well. And it's, you know, yeah, it's, it's good because I think for a lot of um, our sector, we work across a number of different um, areas as well, too. So I think just getting clarity on how, yeah. um, how that sort of changes too is, is sort of really important for everybody because it's a, it is a constantly shifting landscape. Of course, of course. And so we, I mean, we're taking that into consideration wherever we can. Um, and please, whoever was asking about the dance threshold, please do reach out to Kathy so that she can put you in touch with me. Um, we are aware that the landscape is changing. And at the end of the day, we're looking for your best efforts. Okay, because that's what that's what we're giving. That's what we're giving to you. And it's a massive step that you've spent the last hour with us listening to this dry and boring topic. No, so, that's right. and look, thank you. our engagement too in, with Ausdance, it was very easy for us to communicate with you as well. And we had to work out our, our own licensing for our programs as well, too. So, um, you know, I found you guys very responsive and it was very easy to, you know, some of the language was very much about dance schools. And I said, well, we're not a dance school. This is yes. what we do. But then we worked through and, and something was tailored that, that suited us and we understood what we were doing so yeah it was great Terrific. glad to hear it all right everybody enjoy the rest of your wednesday um and happy licensing happy dancing happy life yeah thank you very much thank you bye, bye.